So it's recording, recording in progress. So I see Terry there. Hello, Terry. Good to see you, my friend. Where, where are you at, Terry? I'm in a conference room at a, an alumni hall at Wake Forest University. Well, very fancy. Right. And Liz, I see well, you. Because I don't have an office door, so. <laughs> don't have an office door. <laughs> hey, Liz. Hi, Liz. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Good to see everyone. It's great to see you and everyone else as well. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Hi, Wendy. Wendy. How are you? Good to see you. I'm good. I'm on my way up to uh, Ocean City. I'm at the airport waiting for my flight. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So you're coming to the MAC conference. Yep. Yep. That is wonderful. I'm I'm so sorry. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to miss you. I, I'm having to, to miss it uh, this time. Everybody's going in my stead. So... Uh, have some things happen in here. So, but looking forward to hearing how, how this goes. And this, and this is going to be a, as you all know, is going to be a preview of the Mid-Atlantic Archaeology Conference. And what we um, have been doing for about the past, gosh, 15 years now is with staff interns, we have them uh, uh, work on projects throughout the year. Uh, that they're here, and then they deliver these as conference papers at the Mid-Atlantic Conference. So um, this year, um, uh, Mary had the idea, which was wonderful, is add this into the Lunch and Learns and do a, a five-minute preview to have everybody give a very uh, short, sweet, and succinct version of their paper uh, for what's going to be delivered on, uh, on Friday, Friday afternoon. Um, and uh, actually, it's going to be on Friday morning, right? It's Friday morning. I got the, 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 the schedule right here. Yeah, it's 8 a.m., I believe. It's, it's 8 a.m. So this is a more civil hour than 8 a.m. at a conference. So, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, well, um, so uh, the, what, we're, what we've been working on this season, as most of you all know, has been the home farm. And the papers that are being presented today cover some of them are, are most are specific to uh, individual sites and um, the in, what the interns have done has have been to focus much of their work over the winter in terms of analyzing sites and even and writing the reports for these sites so um, Chris has been working with them on in January and February and part of part of this month in March in terms of having all of them write a section of the report and um, uh, Rebecca, Becca Davis, who's going to be starting, starting, she has actually done an overview. And then um, each of the other interns are going to be talking about the specific sites they, they were looking at. So what's great about this is how, how we work this over the wintertime is um, interns have been, intern staff has, have known what sites or what analysis they're going to be doing since probably about November, October or November. And so uh, in some cases, the site had already been excavated and, and they were you know, polishing up some of the records on that. In other cases, like with Emily, she knew she was gonna be excavating the site before it was even excavated. So she was able to get in there and understand you know, what, you know, take active role in, in the uh, discoveries. And then um, starting in January, all the interns have been working with Chris on writing up their section on the report. So this gives them a line on their CV to contributing to a report. And then of course this MAC conference gives them a line on their CV for delivering a conference at a paper. So, and this is, you know, uh, ever, all of the interns have done an amazing job in their research. I and mean, we're so excited about what the finds are and uh, what y'all are gonna be listening to today. So without further ado, what we'll do, um, what I'll, and I, I've told everybody this, um, we're, the interns are just giving a five minute overview of their uh, papers, and this will allow for questions afterwards. So at um, five minutes, at four minutes, what I'm gonna do is give everybody a, um, a, a, five, a, four, a one minute warning, and I'm gonna get my timer out here and, um, Add one for five minutes. And uh, without further ado, what we'll do, are you uh, ready, Becca? Yes. 
<laughs> All right. Well, Becca Davis is going to be opening up the, the uh, session for us. And her paper is entitled Finding Place in Open Spaces, a review of the phase one survey of Montpelier's home farm. So, Becca. All right. Let me share here. Okay. Awesome. We can see it, Becca. Awesome. Great. Give me one second. That's what I want. All right. So let me just uh, finding place in open spaces. Um, so for the past 20 years, there's been a significant push by the uh, Montpelier Archaeology Department to understand the meaning of space and place for the individuals who resided on the, the presidential plantation of James Madison Jr. Um, in 2012, archaeological investigations turned toward uh, the economic center of the Madison Plantation to the area known as the home farm. So this mini presentation will give you an idea of how we discovered the home farm space, describe survey methods used and resulting features found. At its core, the home farm project represents um, a deviation from established practices used in, typically in phase one survey. However, through these methods, uh, the Mount Pelier Archaeology Department can mitigate the destructive nature of archaeology, uh, especially at a national trust site, um, as it promotes a wider involvement among different subfields. All right. Why aren't we advancing? Sorry, folks. There we go. No, nope. there we go. So uh, what does archaeological survey entail? Um, depending on the size of the site, normal excavation techniques like pedestrian survey, GPR, geophysical restivity, um, LIDAR would be prioritized and utilized more readily. However, given the size of not only the original Madison estate, which was over 5,000 acres, and the current estate, which is, I believe is a, a little over 2,500 acres, um, its topography and geography and the, the wide range of locations of each of these sites requires ultimate methods to be used. Uh, coupled with the lack of documentary records, um, consistently changing land use patterns and Dolly's sale of the plantation in the 1840s. And then, you know, we've got that little thing called the Civil War. Um, we, ha we have to mitigate these circumstances and metal detecting incre increases our chances of locating these kind of ephemeral needles in a landscape filled with historic haystacks. So let's just take, again, a quick look at the typical survey techniques. We've, uh, on the left, we've got pedestrian survey. You're just walking around a site, GPR, ground penetrating radar, um, geophysical survey LIDAR, and, and then finally the STP shovel test pits. And where the metal detecting methods come in, we've, we're using GPS coordinates. So we've got high levels of accuracy of where we are standing on the landscape. We then place 20 meter grid spacing um, down on a potential site. We walk, again, we incorporate pedestrian survey with the metal detector. Any hits that we fi find are typically within five to six inches from the surface. And any area that has 10 or more hits in an area we, we determine as a site. So our awesome metal detecting you know, team headed by Dennis, um, you know, each hit is recorded. Um, in some cases, pictures are taken, and then sometimes the objects are reburied. Well, most, most often the objects are reburied. And again, it should be noted that the typical survey techniques outlined here have all been conducted in the course of the, the last you know, 15 to 20 years. Um, it's the addition of the metal detecting that makes this process really revolutionary. And again, I, should, I, I wanna emphasize that uh, metal detecting is, um, only is solely used in locating a site um, with extra care being given to preserve the context as much as possible. Becca, we're at one minute left. Oh, all right. Ah. Dun, dun, dun. All right, so the first reason why we're using metal detecting is, um, is that we need to find, we need a broad overview of the landscape that's being used and in-depth analysis and excavation happen later. Uh, hands down, our, number two, hands down, archaeology is an expensive endeavor. Full of excava full excavations can take months or years. Um, so uh, this, again, um, 
help allows us to do a lot of work in the least amount of time. And for most of us, archaeology and museum world space is at a premium, like the space. Um, Montpelier's collection alone uh, holds over 3 million artifacts. But thanks to metal detecting, the SDPs we house, some, some of them, the artifacts are in situ, uh, you know, in the ground. And most importantly, I think, this method was approved by the Montpelier Descendant Committee. And given Montpelier's development of the rubric, the use of Dr. Blakey's clientage model, um, which was developed in the 90s at the African Burial Ground, the archaeology department is committed to leveraging our expertise for the benefit of the MDC, our client, to help reclaim the rights uh, in telling of their own narratives. So where are, this, are these sites located? Using these techniques, we, um, over the last year, we were able to detect, you know, the blacksmith sh shop, roads and waterways, how they were working, farrier and blacksmith site, um, and a burn site slash tobacco barn, which my colleagues, my fellow interns will talk about right now. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Becca. That was wonderful. Really, that was a really just well uh, orchestrated overview of what we're doing here and how we're, how we're able to find, put all these sites into context. And uh, next, um, Jennifer McKee uh, will be uh, talking about the blacksmith shop. Her title of her page, paper is Forging Ahead, Excavations of the Upper Blacksmith Site at James Madison's Montpelier. So Jennifer. Okay. Hello, everyone. Let's see. So I'm going to start off with a little bit of background on the blacksmith shop before the one that we dug at, just to give you a little more information on that. So during the 18th century, the blacksmith was actually located right near the main house where the temple currently stands. The shop provided a lot of uh, the income for the plantation, and they sold a lot of the materials produced to outside people. They also took in uh, sorry, both my spot. <laughs> uh, they also yeah. took accounts where they were fixing things and making things for outside people. The books were kept by Moses and the other blacksmiths which were indicating that they were literate and somewhat trusted, at least with being able to have that connection to the plantation's funds and be able to collect the money for it. So the archeology span around the site revealed large amounts of slag, iron hardware, and things like horseshoe nails, lock parts, knife blades, a metal detecting survey produced some more nails, slag, and scraps. Uh, and the account books show that there were thousands of transactions that occurred during the 18th century. So sometime around 1809, James Madison Jr. decided to alter the landscape around the mansion in order to increase the formal grounds and adapt to the picturesque landscape design. The construction of the temple and ice house followed with the chosen location being what is used to be the blacksmith site. So that's when the blacksmith site moved to another location. We think that location was over near the overseer. So a metal detecting survey revealed an iron rich site which suggested a potential location for the blacksmith shop. High densities of iron were located across the area, and it's also located at the intersection of two roads. The artifacts likely date the site to the first half of the 19th century, although we're not quite sure how it fits into the chronology of the plantation and blacksmith operation just yet. So our excavations revealed that there was a brick foundation that we believe may have been the forge. So our hypothesis that this is forge is supported by the precedence of presence of a lot of slag, which is the byproduct of blacksmithing, that are in surrounding units. Iron artifacts were also found in large numbers across the site. 
And there was, in addition to slag, there was a little bit of charcoal, but not too much, but possibly indicating that charcoal was a fuel source. We also got an assortment of various nails, tools, lock parts, chain links, and clipped iron. The location of those artifacts kind of gives credence to our hypothesis that the brick foundation did belong to the forge, as many of those are, objects are indicative of blacksmith work. The distribution of the objects also indicate that the area surrounding the forge may have been the blacksmith's work area. The location of this and the earlier 18th century blacksmith shop raises questions as to the intention behind their placement. The 18th century blacksmith shop was very near the mansion where the inhabitants were undoubtedly keeping watch over the shop. This was likely due in part to the inherent power dynamic of, the, of plantation life, but also the overall value of the blacksmith shop on the plantation and its operation. The Madisons would have had the ability to look out upon their investments, both in business and human investments. The proximity of the shop to the mansion would have provided assurance that the work was getting done and those doing it were behaving themselves. On the other hand, this meant the enslaved individuals would have known they were being watched, likely altering their behaviors accordingly. Jennifer, we're at one minute left. Okay. Thanks. So even after the 18th century blacksmith shop moved, they could not escape the watchful eye of those above them. The site we've identified in the 19th century shop is across the road, not far from the location of the overseer's house and likely had a clear line of sight between the two locations. While the people watching may have changed, the power held over the enslaved workers at the blacksmith shop did not go away. The exact tasks of the 19th century blacksmith shop are not yet known, and we have no documentary evidence of outside transactions like those during the operation at the 18th century shop. But despite those potential changes in duties, the enslaved would have continued to be watched in much the same way as that of the 18th century shop. And now I'm muted. So thank you, Jennifer. Yep. Uh, appreciate it. Um, our, uh, the next paper is going to be given by Nathaniel Glasgow. Uh, intersection, the title of his paper is Intersections of Roads and Lifeways at the Lower Blacksmith Shop. So take it away, Nathaniel. All right. <clears throat> All right. Do we have a visual? We can see it. Yes. All right, cool. Um, phase two excavations um, at an early 19th century blacksmith shop um, at Montpelier have uncovered tangible evidence of the relationship between the movement of people between different places on the plantation. The blacksmith shop was divided into two sections for our phase two excavations. Lower blacksmith was two smaller and less dense concentration of artifacts. Um, there were a lot of nails um, down the hill towards the mill run. The STP survey found that in contrast to upper blacksmith, there was very little brick, slag, or ceramic material. Excavations at structure number one of the two um, artifact concentrations identified a small amount of what was likely rodent bone as well as some uh, charred corn kernels. This assemblage suggests that this may have been an agricultural structure used for the storage of food or animal feed or um, road wagons. Structure number two, a few artifacts, including a belt buckle, occasional glass, and a large volume of nails on earth. As these structures were very near a historic road trace, it is conceivable that they stored wagons or other equipment. Um, the Northeastern uh, outbuilding sits in or near the path of a historic road, which ran from the distant fields through the home farm, running past several work and domestic sites before intersecting with another road near the blacksmith shop. A road that travels along a very similar path is seen in an 1844 um, map where Dolly was selling the Montpelier estate, and you can see that in the left. Uh, the map makes reference to the mill pond as well as the mill stream. It is likely that the current day Chicken Mountain Road may have been 
adopted only after the use of the mill was ended, which would have freed up stream crossings, which formerly were flooded. Historical evidence corroborates a very early introduction to roads in 18th century Orange County. As early as 1749, James Madison Sr. was active in overseeing roads, and in the same year was appointed to oversee the road from Blue Run Mill Road by the Madisons to the main road below Colonel Chews, which could very well be the very road that is in our home farm. After leaving the mill, this road skirted the edge of the woods through the home farm before crossing the headwaters of the mill stream on the other way, other side of Chicken Mountain. This road would have served the purpose of allowing efficient movement on the home farm, as well as would have enabled travel from Madison's Mill to other mills and also connecting other um, major roadways. That the current day Chicken Mountain Road runs a, oh, sorry. Uh, the current day Chicken Mountain Road runs approximately parallel to this road, strongly suggests a relationship in the past. Perhaps this road through the home farm represents an older section of Chicken Mountain Road. Roads and pathways can be thought of as landscapes of movement, meaning that these contexts encapsulate not only activities such as transportation of materials, individuals and ideas, but are also important in forming the culture and memories of the people that use the roads. That the mill road passes right by several sites of labor and domestic activity is impactful. In 1789, the following road order was placed. Order that the following hands of James Madison be taken from William Newman gang as overseer of road. Moses, Jesse, James, Billy, Harry, Robin, Sonny, and Simon. Although it remains unclear if this is in fact referring to the mill road that runs through the home farm, it is a significant list of enslaved people because of how each is intertwined in the story of Montpelier. Several of these men were blacksmiths, such as Mos Moses, or overseer, such as Salmi. Simon was a wagoner, and Harry might have been a courier and a wagoner as well. During his time okay, in the- you'll, you're at one minute. Thank you. Uh, during, during his time in the Continental Congress in 1783, Madison brought Billy to Philadelphia, where he was sold due to concerns about his exposure to the ideas of freedom and liberty. One must consider that Madison's fear may have been of Billy's ability to disseminate this information along the road to other enslaved people. Billy, Moses, Sonny, and countless others traveled along the spirit track for most of their lives. It's important that we strive to understand how these landscapes of movement molded their lives and engendered thoughts and ideas. Retelling the stories of those whose lives were spent at Montpelier cannot be done without an understanding of past landscapes. This final map here shows in black, the current uh, walking path through the home farm. Yellow is the historic road trace. And so you can see that there is a massive loss of perspective and um, abandonment of the literal footprints on the landscape of historic home farm. All right, thank you, Nathaniel. Uh, uh, next up, uh, we have Lizzie, Lizzie Prow. The title of her paper is A Blacksmith and Farrier Shop. It's Obscured Positioning in the Landscape of the Home Farm. So take it away, Lizzie. Can you guys see the PowerPoint? We can see the PowerPoint, yeah. Okay, cool. So this is a farrier shop. Sorry um, to interrupt. I think this is your the desktop. I don't know. That, what? This, is not... this is your computer. Yeah. Um, Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Okay. Now is it not your desktop? Okay, cool. So this site resides down in a basin of the home farm. It's out of view of the field quarters, blacksmith site, overseer, tobacco barn, and burn site, which we have found on the home farm. Um, through metal detector survey of a 20 foot and a 10 foot, we found that there were high concentrations of artifacts. Through phase one, we found that these were often uh, horseshoe nails, 
used and unused. So we kind of, our first hypothesis that was that this was a farrier site. Um, through its location on the home farm, the elevation changes drastically and it follows along the uh, road and the water line. Um, this location became really beneficial because uh, through more excavation through phase two, we found that there was a lot of slag and more uh, tools that you would see with blacksmithing. A letter um, in the 1800s from James Madison's cousin suggests that he uses the placement of this blacksmith site by water uh, for new water power bellows. Madison's cousin drew him a picture and labeled and explained to him what each part of a water bellow would be for his new blacksmith site. Um, they used a well with a ramp pump underneath it to thread the water and the pipes and uh, make the water bellows work. Um, so there's kind of an overlap due to artifact um, identification that James Madison Sr. had his blacksmith site by the temple. And at some point he was ordering two sets of blacksmithing tools and there's mention of him having multiple forges and fires going at once. Um, so it may have overlapped with this blacksmith site. So he had two running. Um, then there was the uh, transition to a blacksmith site up by the five overseer um, on the western side of the home farm. And it looks like there may have been a continuation of artifacts um, and blacksmithing tools that align with the Western blacksmith site. Um, through the excavation of a trench, a Confederate infantry button was found. This goes along with um, the hypothesis that the site remained during the other blacksmith time period. Um, the button would have fallen off of the soldier's coat from his belt pressure. Um, so he may have been in that site, um, not sure. So this is the trench that the button came from. It is a pipe uh, placed by the DuPonts in 1908. And they utilized the greenstone and brick bats from this stone pier structure identified as being um, further towards the early 1800s. Um, it showed evidence of demolition through um, uh, uh, sorry, charred wood and uh, the darker soil on the exterior flatter side um, of the pier. Um, so it may look as though the DuPonts utilized this space and they were able to reuse this structure and the blacksmith site for their own purposes. So for the farrier work at the site, we found- Lizzie, you're at one minute. Okay. We found uh, parts of horseshoes. We found these whole horseshoe nails. We found the tips of horseshoe nails. Um, the evolution of a horseshoe uh, really started in the 18th century. Um, and so the shape of this horseshoe nail helps us, horseshoe nails and the horseshoes themselves help us to date around the 1800s when the evolution of horseshoes started. Um, and then we found a lot of hand wrought artifacts such as staples, chain links, um, structural nails that we found were a lot of L heads. And then we found some of these fragments of tools from the ironworks. Um, so this blacksmith shop and farrier site may have overlapped with two other blacksmith sites and been able to run along the road and use the water bellows for its power. So thank you. All right, thank you, Lizzie. Um, our uh, final paper today is gonna be by Emily Ingram and it's entitled Excavation and Analysis of the Burn Site. What is it? So I'll let you take the screen, Emily. <laughs> Thanks. All right. 
Can everybody see it good? Yes. Cool. All right. So yeah, so I'm Emily um, and I did my um, paper on the burn site. So from a bird's eye perspective, the burn site has three depressions with a berm formation and a subrectangular shape around them. The outcome of the excavation revealed a three bay fire carrying tobacco barn similar to the one found several yards from this site. The objectives of the excavation of this area was to test the findings of the previous archeologists and determine what was located at this site. Also to determine when this building was built and how does it compare the, to the tobacco barn core that was excavated in 2012. The 2004 STPs that were executed revealed significant amounts of burnt clay, charred wood, and ash. This evidence along with the two features found during SCP suggested a hypothesis that materials were being burned and there was a building at this location. In the units above the subsoil, there is a burn subsoil lining in the burn pits. Above that strat was the fill split into a burn trench fill and an upper burn pits fill. So two different ones. Outside of the pits, there was mottled soil above the subsoil. Um, and the strat above that was also consistent throughout the site and that layer can contained lots of stones and artifacts. Um, this layer points to a refurbished use of the barn. So a variety of artifacts were found at this site, many of which suggest the site was also used as a domestic site. Um, however, this data is preliminary and as not everything has been cataloged from this site. As mentioned above, during the metal detecting survey, a whole horseshoe and a wrought iron ring were excavated during the phase one. During the phase two, very little amounts of domestic artifacts were excavated. A small bone button fragment was recovered as well as several pieces of glass. Um, and you can see in the, the bottom right-hand corner is the bone button. So when excavating at the burn site, archeologists recognized similarities between, uh, between this site and a previously excavated tobacco barn a few hundred yards away. That site, was a tobacco barn that was then later converted to a wheat threshing barn. Um, the tobacco barn quarter site is very similar to this tobacco barn site. This structure dates to the 18th century and remains standing into the 19th century when it was converted into a wheat threshing barn. We know that the late 19th century letters document the earliest evidence for a threshing machine and artifacts that suggest early 19th century activity. However, before the barn was converted into a wheat threshing barn, it was briefly occupied by the enslaved community. This is indicated by the domestic materials found at this site. So as you can see in the pictures, both sites have a three bay tobacco barn design. At the burn site, we believe that the three depressions equate the three bays. Before excavations of the tobacco barn quarter, the archeologists believed that the site was a location of slave quarters. For the tobacco barn quarter, um, it was the 2004 STP survey when they discovered it was a tobacco barn. For the burn site, it wasn't until the phase two excavations that they noticed that it was not a brick clamp, which was what um, the archeologists in 1987 originally thought that it was. And the tobacco barn hypothesis was confirmed when the pits and trenches were discovered at the burn site. So even with the many similarities of the two sites, there are some differences as well. The tobacco barn quarter has a known borrow pit that was part of the phase three excavation. It is unknown if there is a borrow pit around the area of the burn site tobacco barn. One thing that makes the burn site unique from the tobacco barn quarter is that there is a berm formation around the outside of the barn. This redeposited soil from the burn pits could have been used to make the building taller using less building materials and having a good distance from the tobacco in the ground. In addition, the clay dig from this central pit could have been used for daubing the log walls of the building um, and obliterate the need for a borrow pit as found in the tobacco quarter. And because of phase three excavation was done at the tobacco barn quarter, there are a lot more of the site features open up for analysis data at that location than at the burn site. However, this are at one minute. Okay, <laughs> thanks. However, the similarities lead us to believe that the burn site is also the location of another tobacco barn. During the excavations, the working hypothesis was that the burn site tobacco barn may have even been built to replace the tobacco barn quarter after it was converted into a wheat threshing barn in the 1810s. More excavation would need to be done at the burn site to obtain more data to provide more into this theory. Um, through looking at the collected nail data that we do have, it appears that both buildings were built in the early 19th century, 
Um, but it cannot be said for sure if both buildings were standing at the same time or if one was built one after the other. Um, all in all, we need more um, excavation done at the burn site to determine more about a lot of the questions and hypotheses that we have. Thank you. All right, thank you, Emily. And thank you all for uh, your excellent papers. Some great imagery there and some uh, um, really, it's fun to see the 2021 uh, season summarized so well. And the continued analysis that goes into this with what you all are doing is just fantastic. And what I wanted to do was open up the floor for any questions that you all might have. Um, I'm gonna peek through the messages here. You can either type your questions in or you can just unmute yourself and uh, go ahead and ask. Don't feel like you need to raise your hand, just unmute and ask the uh, question. Kathy asks, um, what is LIDAR? Do any of y'all want to take a crack at that? And so I, it's a fancy like laser that they shoot at the ground. <laughs> exactly. That's yeah. as technical as I can get. I'm sorry. <laughs> that is what I would say exactly, yeah, Becca. Is it's yeah, uh, lasers that are shot on the ground and produced as a high resolution terrain map. Um, it's uh, um, the gift that keeps on giving at Montpelier. <laughs> and with that, and, uh, and Terry said, yeah, it's magic. I mean, how it works is there's science behind it, but from my perspective, you're right, Terry, it is magic. <laughs> so um, I think it's important to note that it gives us, it provides elevation models at just tiny, tiny increments. Um, it produces such a dense point cloud for the, uh, with, that you get back with that data. Um, and you can cut through tree cover, all kinds of things. So, so it really is giving you measurements of the actual ground surface as it is. So, um, uh, so really just, it's magic. And what you're using your fingers, it's two centimeters, which is pretty amazing. And Tom, who is a old friend of Rhodes here at Montpelier, Tom Chapman just asked the question, and I believe this will be directed to you, Nathaniel, has the road trace been mapped all the way to above Blue Run Bridge, which would go through the Northwoods and by Mount Athos, I presume? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I believe that the original road went right by Arlington House. There's a road trace adjacent to the house and it cuts across the field and it links up with the old plank road. I think that a lot of that old road, um, like you're describing, came by Arlington House and then cut over. Um, it's a little, I'm still working on that part of it, but I'm afraid I can't answer it more too much better than that. Well, Nathaniel did it. And also because it, what Nathaniel's talking about and what Tom is talking about is a long ways from the, uh, the home farm site. So uh, I, Tom, you probably have an idea that Nathaniel has been looking at these roads on a much, much broader picture, which is very cool. And I saw a note, um, this is from Lizzie. Uh, Lizzie says, when you described the DuPont reuse of the blacksmith site, was that the one at the basin of the home farm? Sorry if I missed it. So that would be for uh, for you, Lizzie. Uh, sorry, yeah, to clarify. So there was the uh, creek that ran by at this basin blacksmith site, and they placed an iron pipe trench through there to go up the hill and up by the pony barn and a little past it there is a well um, well tower and that's where they had the water go somehow all the way up with their large iron pipe thank you yeah and what's great with all this is you can really see how um you know the interns have taken a 20 2,650 acre context for the sites they're looking at and looking at connections between all of these, which is, you know, really um, what uh, gets into what, you know, the, the, the theme of this session is, which is movement on the landscape. So, you know, it's taking the home farm and putting it into a broader, broader context. Um, I had a question I've been dying to ask you, Nathaniel, if that's all right. 
what um what set of evidence do you feel like in looking at the roads is the best way to find these ephemeral road traces you know because you illustrated that some are on these maps but trying to link the maps up to the landscape is so difficult and then there's evidence on the on the landscape what's the the nexus what's what's kind of the have you found is the critical link to making all those work uh, I think it kind of goes into, you know, what's, what's the big picture, you know, is that I like to think of it not necessarily as roads, but roadways, because, you know, you'll have, mm. it will go from point to point, say the Gordonsville Orange Road, um, it changes over time. Um, you have to, for example, through the home farm, I found it useful to, to walk through that old road trace and get a feel for where it might go and corroborate that with LIDAR. Um, for example, if you know, you've got a really steep slope, you may think the road probably doesn't go directly up it. And so it's just a holistic kind of study. Um, there's also older deeds oftentimes reference points to roads, and that's been very helpful. Mm. So it, it is just a menagerie of all kinds of everything you can think of, but LIDAR and walking the ground are the two biggest ones. That's great. And we've had a lot of a lot of We've had a lot of help with that from uh, our metal detectorists who have a lot of experience walking through the woods. And I don't know if you've had a chance to walk with Lance, but he is the road uh, whisperer along with Dennis. So, mm -hmm. and, and uh, there's a comment from another road whisperer named Tom Chapman. Uh, Tom says the connection with the road order description is very cool and informative. Is there, is any, is any of the old GPS road trace maps we did in your GIS and LIDAR stuff could provide some great overlapping info to narrow down road networks. Yeah, and Nathaniel, make sure I show you this. Tom, years ago, did exactly what you're talking about. This is back in 2008. He walked the landscape at Montpelier and uh, used some earlier GPS technology to map the roads he saw. And then DJ used that in creating and interpreting the LIDAR maps that he did for his thesis. And uh, um, I, I believe that, um, Tom, that DJ integrated in what you did with the, with the LIDAR study. Uh, and that was part of how he was able to, you're working, you're road walking in the winter of 2007, 8, 9, and even before was used for ground truthing a lot of that. I would love to take a look at that. All right, I have some questions, Matt. Yeah, go ahead, Terry. Um, so uh, first off, great job, y'all. <laughs> Thank you. Um, these are these are great, and I'm 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 bummed I'm not going to be able to be at Max to uh, to see the whole the whole um, all of your papers in 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 total. So please uh, send them to me so I can I can read them. Um, I had I also think I just just wanted to point out how and Matt kind of touched on this, but um, you all gave discrete papers, but you did such a good job of tying it into the bigger landscape. Um, and I think there is a lot of, so whether it's, you know, how does this blacksmith shop fit into this long history of blacksmith shops at Montpelier or tying this newly found tobacco barn to the old tobacco barn that we've, that we've known about. Um, that just, um, that's, that's really important to look at the bigger context and um, appreciate that you all did that. Um, I have a question about the blacksmith shops. Um, has there, did you all, Jennifer and Lizzie, notice any differences in the assemblages of metal objects between the two? Um, have you had a chance to compare your data sets and see what the, if any, what, if there's different types of things being produced or something not being produced at one and definitely being produced at the other? I think there was actually a surprising amount for me that was in common, um, more than not in common. Um, the uh, amount of farrier nails definitely um, decided that Jennifer did had a lot more of those. Um, I think one thing that really showed up was the structural nails. Uh, when I talked and like looked at all her data, the there were a lot more machine cut than there were at the uh, farrier blacksmith site in the basin. Um, there were some found, um, many of them 
were uh, L head. Uh, Let's go back where those drops are. It was interesting to see so many of <laughs> Jennifer's um, had a lot of different heads, but she also had such a wide array of nails, not really seen at my site. I don't know if Jennifer has more to add, but. Yeah. I think you covered it pretty well. I was also kind of surprised at the similarities. And we were looking at Lizzie's site as being more of the farrier shop. And then looking at the nail assemblage, we were finding a lot more horseshoes at Blacksmith. So that was kind of surprising. But then there's just like more of a span of type nails at my Blacksmith shop. But I think Lizzie covered pretty much everything. Another thing. Oh. Another thing to consider also in doing the comparison between the two is at the blacksmith shop that Jennifer talked about, we did full excavation down to subsoil, but did not excavate features. And then at Lizzie's blacksmith shop in the basin, we actually stopped at the top of the surface that is from the historic era. So we can't even really do full comparison, like they're unequal data sets, um, but we did do enough excavation or partial excavation at Lizzie's uh, site that we were able to glean that there is a lot in common, um, but we can't really do that full comparison at this right. moment. Yeah, I would be curious at, at um, just like a comparing of ratios, right, of, of, of farrier nails to mm -hmm. other stuff <laughs> and um, other metal objects and seeing, um, seeing if you have a, a larger variety. And, and one of the reasons I asked that is because um, I think this could help Lizzie with your argument that we have a transitional Mm -hmm. blacksmith shop because the the blacksmith shop that is up by the main house right is is producing goods for the entire region not yeah. just for the plantation um and and so i would i would toss that blacksmith shop into the, a similar comparison right where we would have ratios of farrier nails to other other stuff and um and see what kind of differences we have um because the two blacksmith shops that are in home farm seems are by roads. They seem to be transportation dominant, right? Um, at least the way they're play, placed on the landscape, whereas the one up by the main house is, um, as I'm sure, doing transportation related things, but is also a, a, a money maker, right? For for the um, for Madison Senior, so it's it's producing additional goods, and I think you just that might be a way to to pick out some some other stuff. Um, Nathaniel, I was really struck by your comment about the presence of animal feed um, at those two structures, um, which at first made me think agricultural, but then made me think this is a full service horse station, right? We've got to, you get your, because there's a spring right down there too, right? So you water your horse, you feed your horse and you get your horse reshod. Um, right. Um, it's kind of one-stop shopping, um, which I thought was, um, I thought was really interesting. Um, and I loved your use of Billy and, and pulling all of that out. I thought that was really neat. Um, one thing that I learned about two months ago, um, you all know Gabriel, um, the insurrectionist, um, and, uh, who led the, um, uh, the failed slave revolt in Richmond. He was a blacksmith. Um, and, and I think there's something to be said about blacksmith shops because they're these transportation hubs as also being sites of political resistance, of, right, where communication happens, where um, ideas are passed back and forth. Um, and I think, uh, Nathaniel, I think you, you kind of touched on some of those, some of those ideas um, uh, in talking about um, uh, Billy in, in that context. Um, so I thought that was really neat. Um, anyway, thank you all. You guys did such a great job and, and we know so much more about the home farm now um, and so much more about Montpelier um, than, we, uh, than we did a year ago. So amazing work. Well, thanks, Terry. There's a question from Tessa and looks like this is for uh, Emily. Even though you all found no evidence of a borrow pit at the burn site from the units that were dug, is there any possible evidence for one seen in the LIDAR imagery? Um, I didn't see any in the LIDAR. I don't know, Matt, if, if you saw 
anything, but I didn't see any evidence of it. Yeah, you're that, that's what I took to Emily. When we've looked at it, we didn't see any evidence. Mm -hmm. I I was thinking when we were um, when you showed your image, Emily, of the um, of the tobacco barn quarter, it made me wish that we had done LIDAR before we did the excavations, because once you do the excavations, you alter the terrain. And so we could have you could have been using that as a model, the LIDAR at the tobacco barn quarter where there was a borrow pit, just to try to see how that could be seen at the burn site. But you're right, there's there's no haven't seen anything, but as you said in your paper, we need to um, do some more excavations there to op open it up. And uh, the conclusions y'all have drawn from the few units we have opened are just absolutely incredible. Um, and let's see. Um, oh, and Matt, that makes me question. want to. The... Um, it, it, is there a way to describe the throughput you're achieving in metal detecting, e.g., something like at the current rate of progress with the current level of staffing? and volunteers, we're doing 20 meter and 100 foot detecting at 300 acres per year, and will likely cover the rest of the entire 1500 unsurveyed acres in five years, or something like that. Thanks, great presentations. And Lou, this sounds like a calculation for you. you I remember you gave us a projection on how many labor hours there were from the plantation over 160, 50 year period, which was just mind blowing. So I'll have to get with you uh, to, to, to look at that. Um, but and not prepared to answer that question right now, but there's a lot left. There's a lot, a lot left. It's, it's in probably a couple of lifetimes. And Terry, um, you had another question. I, we, we, it, it, we bumped into each other. I, I just threw it in the chat. I was just saying the, the LIDAR was so clear for, for those, that tobacco barn that it just makes me want to look all I mean, you probably have already done it but um just just comb comb it looking for looking for three squares where are there three squares and try and try and find them all because it's such a clear pattern and chris you you say oh. you know, thanks terry that's right and that's that's the wonderful thing about having staff do these analyses is that staff you know focus on questions that they're looking at and then begin looking at all these data sources. And this, this brings in um, the uh, Nathaniel, I, you had put in the chat that you had forgotten to talk about the, uh, uh, our favorite rods, the dowsing rods. Do you want to men mention that? Uh, I would just say I'm not good at it, but I, I gave everything I could think of a shot, including dowsing rods. <laughs> <laughs> it, it takes some practice. I. I might have some genetic. Uh, I've got two water witches in my family, and I, I had a, we had staff that doubted whether it works. So I spent a lot of time behind, with those rods. So keep at it. It's finding that balance. It's not magic. There's science behind it. But like Terry said, it's like the lidar. There's science, but with our level of knowledge, it may as well be magic. Where's that line? So. <laughs> I have a question uh, kind of raised at Jennifer and Lizzie. I know um, Lizzie are planning on talking about it in at Mac and I don't think touched on it here. Um, and it kind of ties in what Jennifer was talking about with the purposeful placement of the blacksmithing operation, um, specifically under the thumb of the Madisons or those in power. And it ties to what Terry was talking about with um, blacksmiths often being able to facilitate the trend like transfer ideas they're strong figures of power and of knowledge on the landscape and they're as nathaniel talked about they're on a road but my question um is kind of geared at lizzie here is this your site is at the bottom of the basin and it has zero sight lines to the main house or to the overseer's house and i'm curious what you kind of what kind of conclusions you've come to or ideas you've bounced around on what that means or how that might aid in our understanding of um, enslaved community and the use of that site in the 19th century. Yeah, thank you. Um, so an idea of it is its placement may have been a lot to do with the power of water bellows for why the Madisons may have placed it there is takes less enslaved to do it and utilize it. Um, and then once it transitioned to the Western by Western of the home farm by the overseer, this space can um, 
and I believe was still utilized by the enslaved. They were able to use it to produce their own goods, being along this road trace. They were able to trade those goods they were making for their own profit, making things for themselves. They then had this really quiet private space where they could be discussing what's going on, mm-hmm. exchanging information, um, a lot of like what had to do with Gabriel. Um, it's kind of what they could have had for themselves, a way of them taking this place that they built and utilizing it then for themselves and not the Madisons taking everything they're doing and making their own money. They're now making and doing things and getting to profit from themselves. And this was just a space where they really had this privacy and ability to take control without the overseer or someone on the home farm watching over them at all times. Fuzzy. That's awesome, Lizzie. And this gets into you know questions that the descendant committee, Montpelier Descendant Committee, has asked us to pursue, which is, you know, what, you know, not in addition to acknowledging the labor that the ancestors you know. Uh, um, produced at Montpelier and uh, were forced to give over, what were the intellectual contributions of the ancestors and how this contributed to the ideas that and, and the, uh, the, 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 the production at the plantation? Um, Tyler has a question. Um, I have a question about survey methods, especially LIDAR. How accessible is that technology to Montpelier? Is it still hard to come by and costly, I imagine? Um, yeah, for that, we actually have flown LIDAR over the, uh, we didn't fly it, there's a company that flew it, but we had a, uh, a wonderful donor, Cindy Ruscha, who provided that for us based on her love of what was at Montpelier, and that has been a huge source of information, so we always thank Cindy for that. <laughs> yeah. And the, the LIDAR maps are available on the web. Um, uh, if anyone's interested, Tyler, I can, I can send you a link. You're on, the, on, on our um, uh, Montpelier Archaeological Archive project. And uh, the maps that you use, there's some LIDAR imagery on those. Um, Carolyn has a, uh, a question. I've been associated with Montpelier since my first dig in 2007, 15 years. I see such progress in technology and rethinking as well as inclusiveness of the lives of the enslaved people and marvelous overview. And uh, each season and year brings new discoveries. I'm interested in the blacksmithing, transportation, and exchange of ideas relating to, to freedom. So it, do, do any of you all have some thoughts in what you've been working on, on this theme of ideas, you know, the transportation and exchange of ideas and its relation to freedom? So actually, I, I'm not really like, I'm not working on the blacksmith site, but being a part of uh, the department and the field school, again, just to um, kind of mirror what I believe it was Chris who said, uh, blacksmith, what, or maybe it was Terry, but the, the blacksmiths were poli- could be political figures. They were oftentimes political leaders um, of enslaved populations, and they were able to move, I think, from what we're finding, they the fact that they are placed on the the on roads, primary roads, the fact that they're doing so much work out, off off site, like outside of the plantation, they were able to move and navigate the landscape a, a lot differently than you know somebody working in the house or working on the agricultural side of of um, of things. So I think that's what we're seeing. And as far as relating to freedom. Um, that is a really interesting question, um, one that I really can't can't speak to yet. So, mm. this is this is a topic that I've been very interested in exploring. The South Yard, um, this idea of um, uh, political ideas and 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 ens- enslaved African Americans engaging in political action. Um, and and I think this just further buoys that 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 idea and that that um, that really important thing to note. And I think it's really important to note because Montpelier is 
the birthplace of the US Constitution, right? And so this whole concept and idea of, um, of, uh, of action, right? Of in order to participate in a democracy, you're supposed to be an active participant in it. That's how the democracy works. It's what Madison lays out for us in the First Amendment. Right, so um, so this this is just more and more evidence that James Madison was not the only political actor at Montpelier, that everybody who lived here was engaged in a process of political action, and um, uh, and and now we can start to see that um, through this analysis on these blacksmith shops um, as of how uh, potentially these spaces are used. Um, and the people who are in them are engaging in the transfer of ideas, which is freedom of conscience, which is Madison's big idea, right? So anyway, I, so I think it, I think it fit, it, it's, it, it's important and it, it matters and it fits into what we're trying to, what, what my player is trying to do as an institution. Thanks, Terry. And, uh, Mr. Mr. Madison, John Douglas Hall asked the question asked the question about having these reports available for uh, reading. Um, and yes, we will um, we're going to make these available uh, on our um, on our on our uh, papers page that we have. We have a reports page from for much of this. So, oh, I'm sorry, uh, John. That was to me. Pri Privately, but yeah, that's a question that probably a lot of people have about you know being able to get access to this. So, thanks, John. Good to see you here. So, well, well, thank you all for um, uh, tuning in for the, these presentations. It, it was really wonderful to see an, an overview of the uh, what the research that, that the, um, our staff is doing, and. Um, Encourage you all to you know to um, come on a program, come on a dig this 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 spring. We're going to be doing excavations at what we believe is a slave quarter to the side of the visitor center. So, for those of you that are familiar with the visitor center, it's the back entrance to the kitchen. There's a slight rise where where the there's a sign for the home farm. It's right in the near that area. It's um, where years ago. Uh, Tom and I had found, Tom Chapman and I had found a uh, site through an accidental uncovering by contractors, which horrified us because they got out of, they went out of their, 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 their area, their fence. And uh, we've done metal detector survey and found all kinds of things there. So, but um, thank you all for tuning in today. Uh, for those of you all that missed the beginning, we're, we are recording this and we'll make this uh, available. So, but hope you have a wonderful afternoon. It's pouring down rain here. So um, hopefully if you're not, wherever you are, it's dry, but if you're in Virginia, stay dry. So thanks everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Great job, you all. Good job. That was great. Good job, y'all.